Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Kate Pekinskis. I use she, her pronouns. I am faculty and assistant professor here at Carnegie Mellon School of Music in composition and theory. So I have um, half of my time I spend with composition students teaching studio lessons and the other half of the time uh, I teach a, a music theory course. Um, which changes every semester. I have four different courses that I teach. So um, that's how, how I spend my time. And I'm really excited to um, share a little bit with you about what we do here at the School of Music at CMU and to answer your questions. Um, and yeah, and I think that's that's a good place to start. Uh, Dr. Shea, you don't wanna go? Yeah, sure. Hi, everybody. Um, my name's Annie. Um, and so I'm also a composer. Um, I'm an assistant teaching professor here at Carnegie Mellon. I teach um, electronic music composition and composition and music theory as well. Uh, a lot of my classes are split between school of music and this um, kind of interdisciplinary network called ID8, which I don't know if maybe some of you have looked through the website, I've seen this. It's basically where um, people from various disciplines get together, take classes and prototype and make ambitious projects. So my role in in that kind of um, capacity is um, making a lot of um, sound focused into the supreme works, and a lot of them is driven by technology. Um, so yeah, that's kind of how I spend most of my time here. Um, I also teach um, the electronic music majors, so uh, that's that. Um, what's the next thing on our agenda, Kate? <laughs> Well, maybe we'll have um, Jack introduce himself too, since sure. he's here. Hello, I'm Jack. I'm a I'm a current student. I'm a sophomore composition major. Um, so if you guys have any like student oriented questions, uh, you can go ahead and ask me, or you can type them in the chat at any time, and I can answer for you. So maybe just to start, uh, we'll talk a little bit about sort of these four big categories of ways that you can um, study and pursue making music, which we're going to use sort of really broadly um, within these degree programs. Um, there's often lots of crossover and, and lots of interest in each of these four. And I think sometimes it can be hard to, to know which, which degree program sort of fits you and your interests the best, which is part of what this conversation is about. Um, so I'll begin um, I'll begin talking about the BFA in composition uh, briefly, and then maybe uh, Annie, you can do electronic music and we'll sort of tag team BXA and music and tech together. So um, the BFA in composition, it's a bachelor of fine arts degree um, in music composition. So it's a four year program. It's all sort of mapped out for you for four years. And the primary sort of identifier or marker for the BFA in composition uh, is that we are, encouraging you and, and training you to write primarily for acoustic instruments. So live human beings playing um, acoustic instruments, cello, singer, um, clarinet, piano, right? Any of these instruments that, that are uh, available to us in that respect. That's not to say that in your time in studio in a BFA in composition that you won't write a piece with electronics or you might, you know, you could write a piece for um, flute and a looper pedal or all sorts of, you know, there's lots of ways to sort of think broadly about that, but the core um, sort of direction for a BFA in composition is thinking about writing for people playing acoustic instruments. Um, and that's, that's a big core part of that. And then in relation to that, then there's a strong focus on notation. So we're working in Western notation, some sort of document that's communicating the thing that you want somebody else to play on their instrument. Um, and, and the capstone project for that or the senior project for the Bachelor of Fine Arts students um, is an, a piece for a symphony orchestra. So in your senior year, you compose a piece um, for a symphony orchestra, and we actually, um, the Carnegie Mellon Philharmonic here devotes an entire rehearsal cycle and performance to the student orchestra works. So those fourth year seniors and the second year master students, um, they get two full weeks of rehearsal uh, with the orchestra and then a performance at, um, at one of the major halls here in uh, the 
the local part of Pittsburgh area where CMU's campus is, um, which is a really nice thing to have those two full weeks. There's lots of sort of interventions in, in that year that you're writing the orchestra piece where you're working with the, the Philharmonic conductor and he's looking at your scores and making sure that all the parts work together and things are, are going through. So it's a really sort of hands-on experience um, in, in that respect. So uh, you follow sort of the music major core, um, which we can talk about or Belmari and Jack can talk about later. Uh, and the, the big things for a BFA in composition is that we're primarily leaning towards um, notation, sy systems of notation, uh, acoustic instruments, and then that big orchestra piece at the end of the, at the end of your degree here. So that's a, just a brief sort of overview of what happens um, in composition. Uh, how about electronic music? So again, um, similar to uh, the composition major, the electronic music major is also a BFA. And we're probably, we are actually, we are the newest program, um, major program offered at School of Music. Uh, we're in our, currently in our third year of the program and it's been going really smoothly and uh, we have some really great people in the program. And so kind of maybe it's also worthwhile to kind of tell you how this program came about and why we think it's a special program at Carnegie Mellon. So um, maybe some of you have, you know, done a bit of digging around and know that Carnegie Mellon is really well known for its, um, you know, technology forward, innovative kind of thinking. And so, you know, if you have a chance to come to a campus visit, you realize that tech is everywhere. And every second person that you meet on campus is doing something with technology, whether it's artistic expression, or whether it's like, you know, full on fellow machine learning research, things like that. So it's everywhere on campus, it infiltrates everywhere. So my first couple of years here at CMU, through my classes and my appointments, I see a lot of students coming to me with various interests. They all want to make music with new tools. And so after a couple of years, um, we decided, I think, you know, we can get a healthy cohort of students coming in who are very musically forward, who want to become artists, but who are also interested in developing themselves as um, and artists who used uh, cutting edge technology. So in a nutshell, the electronic music major is a program for people who want to make music with, like, with technological or electronic means. And it is an artistically um, focused program. So when you come in, you take your music core, your music major. So all the curriculum, like um, the theory classes, um, uh, orchestration, um, your history classes and electives, those are all shared with um, the composition major. Um, and then you will have opportunities to take like creative coding classes um, and beyond. So basically you can focus on creating music, but whatever that tool is, that's up to you. You know, you can, if you're, um, you've dabbled with some kind of digital software, like Ableton, even GarageBand, logic, then you're already into that kind of realm of making music electronically, right? Of course, if you use microphones, if you record yourself, you do something to it. If you're interested in the possibility of um, what sound can be, right, like through like manipulations and things like that, then this is a place for you. And um, our students will end uh, with a capstone project of their own design. And um, we, our current third years are already thinking about what the capsule projects are going to be. So I can tell you, we're looking at a very ambitious solo album coming out um, that's using a lot of um, AI-driven um, sound processing techniques. Um, we're also looking at um, a site-specific immersive performance piece that a student is trying to uh, put together in the next 18 months. So you can see like the scale to which your musical practice can go on, can be um, unbounded, it's limitless. If you can dream it uh, between myself and two of my colleagues who will be your um, studio instructors, we're here to help you build that dream. So this is kind of why we build this program. Music and technology is a Bachelor of Science degree. So we're now in a different sort of category of degree. Um, and that's really because it's splitting its time um, 
between music and technology. Um, so you'll be taking, you would be taking classes in the schools of engineering, the schools of computer science and the school of music. Um, it's also a little bit more detached from, because you're spending more time interacting with other schools, it's a little more detached from the music curriculum. Um, you, and so that's, that's a, a something to consider within the space of the BS in music and technology, you do choose a music focus. Um, so I'm assuming that many of you here in the room, if you were pursuing a BS in music and technology, you choose something like a composition focus or some sort of creative focus. You can also do a BS in music and tech with like the clarinet. Um, that's an option. And so um, that's available to you. But what happens then is there are some, um, some shifts in terms of what you have access to in terms of one-on-one -on -one, um, interaction. So in both of the BFA programs in composition and electronic music, you have four years of studio lessons. So that's eight semesters of one-on-one -on -one lessons with a studio teacher every week. Um, so Jack takes 14 weeks of lessons every semester with his studio teacher um, and will continue to have lessons with the studio teacher for the four years that he's here pursuing composition. Same thing works if you're majoring in electronic music. You take a studio lesson, you have a studio teacher, that's your one-on-one -on -one hour time every week uh, with a teacher. In the BS in music and technology, and also with the BXA programs, which we'll talk about in just a second, um, you get two years of composition lessons, um, if your focus is in composition, for instance. So you still get that studio time, you still get that hour every week um, with, a, with a teacher, but it's for two years only, not for the full four. Um, so that's part of, part of one of the things that changes um, between the programs, not just in the in what you're studying, but also some of your um, access to that one-on-one -on -one changes. Um, not to say that one is any better or worse than the other. They, we just need, you know, certain amounts of time with certain classes and courses and teachers, depending on what we're studying. Um, so yeah, the BS in music and technology, uh, big things that are sort of different about it is that it's a bachelor of science and that you're spreading your um, courses much more uh, definitely in um, in engineering and computer science and music. And so thinking a lot about um, building musical tools, right, and instruments versus uh, building music uh, is maybe a, a way, one of the ways to think about it. Um, yeah, I mean, I would say music technology program is a tool focus program. So if you're interested in making the next uh, you know, top selling synthesizer, you should take, you should major in this because they will give you the tools to do that. Where if you want to have a startup, a music startup that does, you know, cutting edge music processing, whatever, then music tech is what you should be studying. And you can make music on the side, but your focus is to become an engineer um, of some sort. Um, and some of like the uh, the outcome from this program that we've seen so far um, are more industry-based. So we have sent students to companies like Boss, to Adobe. Um, some students have found work in um, video game companies doing either sound design or writing music for them. So, you know, music can still be one of the things you do, but you will also be equipped with very um, solid knowledge in engineering and um, computer science uh, learning. So yeah, so these are kind of, um, yeah, you know, big picture, but but hopefully that kind of differentiate each of the, uh, the majors quite clearly. Yeah, and then we have um, one more major to discuss, which is called the BXA. Um, and so the, um, the important thing about that is the X stands for a number of possible uh, internal acronyms. So there's a BHA, which is a Bachelor of Humanities in the Arts. There's a BCSA, which is a Bachelor of Computer Science in the Arts. And I can't remember the other ones. Those are like the two, two big ones. Um, and this, the BXA is a little bit of like Carnegie Mellon's alternative to the double major without actually majoring doubly, right? So um, it it is possible with a big asterisk to be a double major at CMU. Um, it 
takes more time than four years, mostly because the core requirements for any major are pretty robust and pretty specific. Um, and so generally of any of the double majors that I've known, they've taken five years to do it just because of the way that that schedules sort of work out. Um, so one of the ways that the Carnegie Mellon sort of acknowledges that its students have a multitude of interests is this BXA program. Um, and so what this means is that you're essentially applying to and existing in two different schools um, or two different programs at the same time. So um, from an admission standpoint, if you wanted to do a BXA in computer science and composition, you would need to apply to and get accepted into both the School of Computer Science and the School of Music. Um, but what it means is that it provides you um, a way to really sort of take on an interdisciplinary um, practice or an interdisciplinary degree where you know you have this 50 50 split between your course requirements for the school of music and your course requirements for the other school to which you're attached um, and there's your senior sort of requirements are then a capstone um, of your designing similar to the space of electronic music but now there's a distinct requirement that you find that project within the middle space between these two schools in which you are um, pursuing work and so um, you will take some school of music courses with your core uh, class cohort when you come in and then you sort of splinter off as um, as you sort of get through the first year and can still take courses in the School of Music, but then you're also sort of taking on this additional sort of parallel life in the other school. And then as you come back towards the end of your degree program, those two things are coming together and um, showing up in like really interesting, cool senior projects. Um, and, and so that's that's something that's part of it. Thinking about studio lesson time again, which I know I mentioned the BFA and composition and electronic music are both four years of studio composition, music technology and BXA are both two years of studio composition. Um, so you'll take, usually it's your first two years, you do um, lessons and then you move on to um, the other sort of side of your program. Um, Annie, do you want to say anything, some examples of capstones that you've seen and? Um... Sure. Um, I have advised two composition BXAs in the last couple of years. Um, so I can mention that maybe give you an idea of what the capstone project was. So one of the students who graduated um, this past spring uh, was the BCSA. So he was a computer science and composition major. Um, his capstone project was an interactive 3D video game. Uh, well, it's it's a video game, but the player gets to make music in real time. So you have to. It's a 3D game, so you have to wear a, you know like an Oculus like a device, and then you know in 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 space in projected space you can use the kind of avatars he gave you. Um, to make little tunes based on where he wants you to go. And then you can grab your own rhythm and you can grab your own chords. But you know, everything is um, like the parameters and musical parameters are defined. So you're not gonna create something that's uh, atrocious. Um, but then the composer himself has defined his parameters for you, but you are willing, you can, you know, go into the space and then play around, make your own music with the parameters he's given you. So I think that was a really successful, successful project. And another one was a very ambitious um, visual album. So uh, I don't know if you guys saw that Beyonce had a visual album last year. Um, so it's basically, you know, it's like a music, it's like a um, music movie, but album length and it's like it's sections, um, but they're all kind of like interconnected um, in, in like meaning and concept and whatnot. So a student of mine, um, for her, she, um, she decided to do, decided to do a very ambitious visual project. Not only um, she wanted to make it with all her friends, right? Being that she spent five years, oh, sorry, four years at Carnegie Mellon and had made a bunch of friends who were performers. Um, she also picked out a lot of skills in filmmaking, um, producing, 
and all kinds of amazing skills. I don't even know how she has time for anything. But um, she managed to produce this album, which was shown not only uh, to peers, but it was actually projected onto the facade of the College of Fine Arts. So if you have never visited Carnegie Mellon, the College of Fine Arts is probably one of the first, if not the first building on campus. It's beautiful. It's over 100 years old. It's got like white marble uh, kind of, um, you know, out, outlook, like facade. And so what the student did was she just projected her visual album onto the building. And then, you know, we had a, an early summer screening with like chairs out in, on the grass lawn and everybody was there to celebrate her capstone project. And I've also seen smaller capstone projects as well, but you know, these are like on the more ambitious scale. Um, so really it, it should be a synthesis of both of your interests, right? And it's um, a project that you feel good leaving the campus with and maybe a good um, portfolio piece to go into maybe industry or graduate studies. And so, you know, um, this is, if you ever want to exercise uh, unbound creativity um, and decide on the most ambitious project, this might be something for you. I think, you know, in, in as much as any of these programs differ from one another, I would also like to offer that, you know, we are very much advocates of the things that our students think up um, and trying to make sure also that they have opportunities to pursue learning in um, arenas, maybe outside of their immediate degree program focus. So um, we have, you know, right now I have a bunch of composers who uh, have just met up with an advanced animation class to do scoring for their short films for their final projects. Jack, I don't know if you are on that list or not. Um, there's a million things to do. So it's not like, <laughs> not like you're not busy doing other things. Um, you know, and we have students who are writing new musicals for Scotch and Soda in the, um, you know, in the extracurriculars. We have students who are um, doing sound design for Lunar Gala, which is a giant fashion show that happens. Um, there's all sorts of ways that our students, both for credit and not for credit, are pursuing sort of the fuzzy edges of the bounds also of any of these degree programs. So um, it's not to say that if you're pursuing a BFA in electronic music that you can't write for an acoustic instrument, right? Um, that that's available to you or or there are ways to sort of think creatively about any of these things. Um, and we're kind of at a place where where it's a great sort of rich ground to do that kind of work. There's people always pushing on the edges of our, our interests. I think, you know, all of us do that as well, just as sort of in our own creative practice. And, and so um, we wanted to, we want to provide sort of the clarity of what the degree program is, but also uh, that, that there's all sorts of ways that you can, can pursue these side projects or these things that you're interested in, um, either for credit or in addition to to the work that you do. Um, I think one thing maybe that we should do is just speak quickly about like a portfolio, um, thinking about applying for this, um, applying for any of these programs and either expectations or, um, and, and yeah, maybe expectations is maybe the best thing to say. Um, also, just to remind you, you can drop questions in the Q&A um, or in the chat as you have them, or if there are things that are coming up that you'd like us to speak about that we haven't spoken about yet, um, just drop those in so we make sure that we can cover cover your questions. Um, Annie, do you want to talk about electronic music portfolios? Sure. So in a, um, in a portfolio, what we like to see is that you have been um, exploring the capacities of electronic means in the way you compose music. And so what this means is you're not, you know, it's not really that you pick up a MIDI keyboard and then you pick a piano sample and you play MIDI notes and then thinking that's electronic music. That's okay, but that should be the baseline. That should be the first step before you actually start making electronic music. So electronic music, what we want to see in the portfolio is do you have some, some kind of 
um, considerations into how you like to change the cells that you're using. So for example, um, you know, you could go out and record um, sounds from the street and you're like, oh, okay, well, these sounds really interesting to me. How do I turn it into music, right? We're not gonna restrict you on how you're gonna make turn this into music because if it sounds like music to you and you want to use them as materials, go for it. We'll come and meet you halfway. Well, you know, we'll, we'll come and like, understand what you're trying to do here. So the prime, the the kind of primary um, thing we're looking for is your willingness to embrace technology in making music, and you have actually go into technology and figure out what it is about these, you know, knobs and and tricks in these plugins that you want to use, or have you gone out and record that and want to use them musically. Right, so they don't have to be super advanced. You know, I, we understand that, you know, not everybody have access to tools for lessons where schools sometimes have offer studios. Um, so that's okay. Even if you just use GarageBand, we want to see that you have thought through what's the timbre differences between, you know, piano, but if you take away the, the hits of the piano, right? You play the piano and you, you know, there's an action and then it's the same. What if you take away the action? What's that sound like to be? How do you make that musical, right? We want to see a demonstration of these kinds of thoughts. And then, yes, you can you can still write music in whatever genre that it is that you want to pursue, right? We have um, people coming in writing songs, writing very experimental sound tapes, or writing acoustic, instru acoustic instruments, but with sound processing. So electronic music is such a broad um, scope and it's not our intention to restrict what you can write stylistically, right? Basically you can come in and, you know, we have students in studios maybe right now dropping beats and that's fine. And they're still learning their orchestration classes, but they have been making really amazing bass sounds because they know how to create those from nothing. So this is the skill that we're gonna teach you but we would like to see that you're on the path of trying to figure that out, right? And in your essays, um, you know, whatever document it is that you have to write about yourself, we would also really like to see why you want to come here and do and study with major with us. And from a composition standpoint, um, the the larger uh, initiatives or themes that Annie mentioned, I think hold true for us too. We want to see that you've spent some time sort of messing around with stuff and trying to figure things out. Um, we have no house style. So whatever you come in, in terms of your own aesthetic interests is great for us. We want to just, part of our responsibility is to help you hone your creative voice and hone your ability to communicate your creative voice to others. Um, and so in a portfolio for composition, we do have some slightly uh, more restrictive requirements in the sense that we need to see a notated score. Um, what notation is can be uh, flexible in the grand scheme of things, um, but generally we're thinking about Western notation. So five line staff um, as, as a, a starting point, mostly because that's, the um, method through which you're going to have the most common ground with your performance colleagues who are going to be playing your pieces. Um, that's not to say you can't write graphic scores and you can't think um, flexibly about notation because I think there's a lot of fun stuff you can do with notation, um, but it is something that we're looking at in the space of the composition program in particular that um, that you have a handle on notation. Um, also, because it's an important thing for you to know in the space of participating in your core courses in the School of Music. Um, and so uh, pre predominantly in the space of a portfolio um, for for composition, we want to see that you have ideas, that you can communicate them, um, that you can sort of think of a whole piece or a whole idea, which can be a minute long, it can be 10 minutes long, right? We're, we're looking for um, your ability to, to communicate a fully formed idea. Um, we do not need to see an orchestra piece if you like if you're looking to pursue a BFA in composition, if you want to write an orchestra piece, great, but they're really hard and time consuming. And so if you have, um, you know, scores, maybe you have a duo for something in a quartet and then a solo piece, that's great. Um, we'd like, if we can, to see a variety of stuff. 
um, a variety of instrumentations, or maybe you have like one super fast piece and then one really slow spatial piece. Um, but mostly it's that that first pass is we're just trying to sort of get to know what you're doing and what you're curious about. When we'll get to an interview stage, so we all have pre-screening and then um, you can advance through the pre-screening when you, you come to an interview. And that's really a conversation about getting to know who you are and what you're curious about, what you're listening to. I think I promise you I will ask you what you're listening to in an interview. Um, and that's not a, it's not a test. It's not a trick. Like, I really just want to know what you're listening to. And so, um, and the best way that we can all learn and all of us here as composers, as music makers, I'm still listening constantly. And I'm trying to listen as wide as I can to, um, to learn and get to know what kinds of sounds are being made and what sound, kinds of sounds speak to me. And, um, you know, you come in and you're like, yeah, I listen to uh, Schnitka and Taylor Swift and Slayer. Great. Awesome. You know, like I, but we, I think the thing that we're, that I'm, I'm looking for is curiosity and, and hunger, like, a, and, and you, that you have your own incentive to learn and to, to grow more, um, you know, because one of the things that's all you, like your success in college is powered by you and your, um, your interests. And so uh, we don't necessarily need you to come in knowing all the things, because if you did, then why would you come to college? We just want you to be, to be curious and, and hungry and to see that that work is already happening, that you're, you're able to sort of start those those things rolling um not that you have to have all the answers but just that that you know you've like started pushing the wheel a little bit and that you're ready to to keep pushing it more um yeah yeah i i would just also add that you know, if you are thinking more towards applying to electronic music and you're like oh but i do write scores that's fine <laughs> you can submit scores too in fact um you know uh, if you are confident in writing scores and reading music, and think it's going to be a huge plus for you um, because the autonomy music program is a music program. So it's not housed in STEM, you know, anywhere else. You are going to be dealing with a lot of music theory, a lot of writing notes, you know, as part of your core, right? So like, you know, if you do have pieces that you write and it's using some kind of electronic processing on top of that, that's fine, right? So don't don't feel discouraged. Like, oh, I can't send in things that's on page. But the primary thing we're looking for is like, yeah, okay, so is 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 this being um, uh, kind of like transformed electronically, right? In some way that it's artistically creative um, for you. First question: How experienced is the average? first year with music composition or electronic music making? Are you looking more for experience slash quality or vision slash potential in a portfolio? Love this question. Um, you know, mostly for me, it's it's potential. Um, so there's, there is some sort of like basic level of, of skill, um, but it's, it's, uh, it's not smaller than you think, but it's, I think the the space of of like how you fit and how you feel in this school, um, which can really be sold um, for you and really solidified for you in the space of an interview or or coming to school and visit, sitting in on a class. Um, the big question is is like, do you want to do the work here? You know, and mm -hmm. and um, you know, for us, it's I would rather you have you know, an idea that you're not quite sure how to communicate yet, then like be able to write really well, like Mozart, you know, I'd rather you show up being like, I really like Mozart, but I want to do this extra thing. Or like, I, I, these are the things about Mozart that I like, and these are the things I want to do, do that are different from that. Um, so in that sense, potential outweighs um, experience. Um, at least from, you know, from composition. I don't know. On the other side, yeah. I would assume it's it's similar. Yeah, I, I agree with Kate. This is, I think we, we share a lot of, you know, a, a lot of these um, ideas when we look at admissions. Um, you know, for us, I can speak with my, uh, 
on behalf of my colleagues also who, who teaches in the electronic music major, what we look at when we go through the pre-screening is do we find this candidate um, have something interesting to say, right? So basically we're looking at your potential to want to do the work to, uh, are you curious about what this field of music making could be? Um, do you have some things you might want to try out when you come? So, you know, we have admitted people who basically just has a really strong drive and maybe, you know, a couple months of experience because they came to the kind of music late. You know, I think most people start with, um, learning music on some kind of instrument, accidentally found a keyboard and garage band or some kind of other software that came with your laptop, right? So um, we understand that the process of getting to electronic music is not quite linear, right? So we're not looking for a super experienced producer. There are programs for those people. We're looking at if you, are you curious about music? That's the first thing. Are you curious about what music, making music with tools can be? Are you curious about sound? And, and at the end of the day, are you open to experimentation? Are you open to come here and find out what will happen if something doesn't, right? So basically potential is something we value very highly. Uh, this is actually a question for me. Uh, what is the student experience like? <clears throat> uh, is it a casual and collaborative environment or does it feel competitive? Um, that's an easy question. And I wouldn't say it's really competitive. It's a very casual thing. We all we all talk to each other. We all have questions that we ask each other. It's usually someone knows the answer to one of them. And then we all maybe if we all don't know an answer, we ask like Dr. P or Nancy or, or something. But um, usually it is a very collaborative space and you shouldn't really feel judged. Like everyone has different musical styles. Like we have in my year, there's two musical theater composers. There's someone who wants to do video games. Uh, someone more interested in pop music so it's really just a variety of things so um yeah it, i'd say it's a very it's like a very um you work together with things if you would like you can also um minor in things um both uh related to music or not so um there's we have lots of students who end up taking like a minor's worth of coursework in economics or something um and so so there are ways sort of there are flexibilities in your schedule especially um i think for composition more so than like a voice major for instance um where you can sort of like work the system to get these certificates um we have a bunch of certificates in in the school of music or you want to minor either in something in music or something else in the college of fine arts or even further out, like you could minor in poetry probably um, if you if you sort of made the plan right. And so um, in addition to sort of the variety of gen eds that you can take also, I'm sure all of you have interests that extend beyond music, which is partially probably why you're interested in CMU. Um, and so there is space for you to pursue those things um, as well in the, in the curriculum requirements. So I think we have one minute late left and i think maybe this is a good opportunity for us to kind of like summarize everything we have said so far by showing you a flow chart that we um, have provided when made for this session so if you're still not too sure about how to make decisions hopefully this flow chart can give you some guidance and it's basically just a summary of everything we just told you about how how can you differentiate between various degrees um, and this will also be made available on the website um, after tonight. So you can also take a look at them um, in your own time. And each one of the kind of, you know, the results are in blue. So those are uh, the degrees. And if you click on them, they should link you to um, the specific majors on our website. And so this is just a, a nice reference. You know, we've been talking about these things. I know it's a lot of information. Um, hopefully it's been helpful and it's it's clarified some things uh, for you all. But this is, um, you know, a good way to just sort of work through the steps of, of the differentiation between each of these programs um, and and should hopefully help you get a sense of, of which, which program you'd like to apply to. 
um, at least to start and then, uh, and then you can hopefully move forward and, um, yeah. Thank you our, to our faculty, Dr. Xie and Dr. Bukinski and Jack for, for your time tonight, of course.